September seems to finish so quickly. I managed to read six books and I have gained a new favorite. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Harry's Book Cafe. Um, in the month of September, I managed to read six books. Doesn't sound very much, but the fact is they have an average of 450 pages. Uh, so it's not too bad after all. Um, all of those six books, books, I have gained a new favorite. So I first thought using this opportunity to go over the books that I read and tell you about what do I think of them and give them a quick ranking. Now, um, I will start from my least favorite to my favorite. So, without further ado, let's dig in. So, occupying the last place at number six is Agatha Christie's The Halloween Party. Now, Agatha Christie, as we all know, has ha had a huge productive um, career and she has written so many novels. Um, the Halloween Party isn't one of her best known novels. In fact, it's quite obscure. That is until the recent movie adaptation, and that's called A Haunting in Venice. Um, I actually did a full movie versus book review. I'll put a link up here. If you haven't seen it already, please have a look. Uh, but after this video, of course. Um, the novel is about a Halloween party hosted by this rich widower. And during that party, one of the kids who was attending the party was brutally murdered. And then the detective, Porot, um, is in charge to find out who her murderer is. Now, her murder was a consequence of previous murders, unsolved previous murders that goes back years. And over the years, that led to the unfortunate demise of this kid. Uh, and the detective needs to go unraveling all these problems, digging into the past and find out exactly who killed this child. So it's quite an interesting concept that in order to solve the current uh, murder, she needs to, uh, he needs to go back to the past and find out and, and start digging. So it's a very interesting concept. I enjoyed it a little bit. The problem with this particular book, and I think it's quite similar to some of other Agatha Christie books, is that the conversation, the language, are a little bit dated. It reads like the grown-up version of Famous Five. Um, I mean, if you like Famous Five, then you probably will enjoy the, the poses here, but certainly for me, I find the conversation a little bit dated. Um, there is certainly a, a little bit of racism thrown in, um, but I guess it's the product of the time. So no complaint from that perspective. I just thought that the story isn't up to the standard of Noma Agatha, Agatha Christine um, excellent standard. I think this one requires the reader to sort of foregone some of the, or forgive some of the leap in logics to actually conclude who the murder is. But you're going to have to read it yourself to find out. Is it a bad book? No, it isn't. Uh, not far, far from it. It's actually uh, a pretty enjoyable read. Um, but compared to Agatha Christie's normal standard, I think this one isn't quite well known for a reason. Um, the next one occupying at the fifth place is Dan Brown's Inferno. Now Dan Brown, as we all know, is very famous for writing the Da Vinci Code and I read that book, it's tremendously uh, enjoyable. In fact, the um, Inferno is the third installment of the Da Vinci Code uh, series of books. Now the books is based in uh, Florence mainly, 80% of the book is actually based in Florence, the rest is split between Venice and Istanbul. Um, very interesting concept, the uh, professor, Logan, I think, uh, he woke up in a hospital bed, he doesn't know how he ended up there, um, but he's actually quite seriously injured. And then just when he was about to get up, he realized, or someone, uh, assailant, assassin, from the outside rush into the hospital and want to kill him off. So the story follows what happens next. He's trying to unravel how he ended up in the hospital and why the assassin wants to kill him. And in the course of that story, he discovered a very, very serious um, um, conspiracy 
event that, if carried out successful, um, can actually alter the course of humanity. So he will do anything that he can, uh, trying not to be killed and solve the mystery behind this conspiracy. Um, I enjoy the book. The only downside about this particular book is that there seems to be, when I'm reading this book, I felt as if I'm reading a thriller plus a lonely planet about Italy or Venice, um, Florence in particular, thrown in. It seems as if I'm reading half guidebook, half thriller. There are so many descriptives and historical backgrounds provided in the story about a particular plazo and artworks um, which can be a little bit distractive and also there's quite so lots of things that wasn't really explained in the book um, a piece of art and piece of history that I find myself constantly have to go and google those things just so that I can um, be fu fully au fait about the uh, developments of what is going on so I think that can be a little bit distractive having said that I'm not entirely sure if I were in his shoe, how would I do do the things differently? Uh, I'm not sure I could. So that criticism needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, I'm actually, I filmed that particular um, um, book review, but I just haven't posted it online yet. I will, that was filmed in um, Florence actually. So I haven't posted it online, but I will do it soon, hopefully this month. Um, I enjoyed it, um, but as I said, I just find it a little bit too long too much details involved in the historical facts. Um, moving on to the uh, fourth place, um, and that is, this might be a little bit surprising, this is actually the last devil to die. Um, so this is the latest installment of the Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman, and um, Thursday Murder Club has been tremendously, tremendously successful over the years. Uh, it centered on four uh, old age pensioners, they live in a um, sort of pension village and they were involved, unlikely heroes, they were involved in solving murders, uh, cold cases, that's going back years. Um, all the books are absolutely hilarious. The conversation they have is just make you giggle almost non-stop. Um, they are fantastic and I think sense of humour is really the biggest strength of the series. However, the latest instalment, The Last I Vote to Die, is a little bit of a letdown. Uh, instead of, the, the humour is absent. Um, the hilarity is definitely absent. I don't find it, I, I find it a little bit disappointing with the lack of uh, hilarity because that, as I said, that is the fundamental strength of the series of books. On the contrary, for this particular one, it is very, very sad. At least a section of it is really, really sad. Uh, and I guess it's necessary for the story development. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. You're going to have to read it and, and find out whether or not it's necessary. In my personal opinion, that particular person dies doesn't really serve a purpose. Um, but Mr. Osman clearly uh, disagrees. But have a read that book uh, and, and see what you think. Um, Nevertheless, it is very, very good. It's just not up to the standard of the previous um, the Thursday Murder Club uh, series. I find it a little bit disappointing. That's why it occupies the fourth place. Now, the third place is was a very difficult choice. I have to deliberate quite a long time because the third place and the second place can really be interchanged. Uh, what swayed me in the end um, is that I like Greek mythology a little bit more than I like Italian history and that's why the third place is uh, the marriage portrait. Uh, you mileage might very well differ if it comes to these two particular books, you might switch them and I wouldn't be surprised to be honest, it's very very subjective between those two um, particular um, books. Um, anyway, so the third one is the, my, uh, the marriage um, the Marriage Portrait, and this novel actually is the shortlisted for 2023 women's fiction. Uh, it's written by Maggie O'Farrell, and she's a very famous writer. Um, she was made famous by her novel Hamlet, describing the life of Shakespeare, his wife, and his son. Um, so Marriage Portrait is another attempt of re um, sort of telling stories 
um, that was a little bit obscure buried in the history and this time it's about Duchess of uh, Fiora. Um, so the beginning of the book really grabs, grapples you. So the uh, the princess, the Duchess, uh, went with her husband to a castle and as she sit down having dinner with her husband, she realizes um, that her husband wants her dead. Um, Lucreza, her name was, and what follows is a jumping back and forth of telling the story how what her childhood was like, how he ended up marrying this duke. Um, it was accidental marriage, in fact, it wasn't supposed to happen. Um, a very, very interesting story, and it traces from the back all the way to the present day and going into the future to tell you whether or not she succeeded avoiding her fate. Very interesting story, incredibly well written. The pause is just unbelievable. It's very, very lyrical, incredibly lyrical. In fact, I really enjoy her writing. It's like poetry, but in a fictionalized world. Um, really well written. That perhaps was the biggest strength of that book. Uh, the story itself is very interesting. Uh, her husband is someone that you will be quite frightened of because he doesn't raise his voice, he doesn't shout. He give order to kill someone calmly, coldly, with, with no mercy whatsoever. And that is, that brutalness or without emotion is something that really uh, unnerves her and it unnerves the readers. Really well written book. I, I tremendously enjoyed it. I did, uh, I, I made a full review of that particular book, but I haven't posted it yet. And once again, just like Dan Brown's, um, Dan Brown's uh, Inferno, this book were, uh, full, uh, book review was actually filmed in Italy, and I'm hoping to get that uploaded uh, later this month. And number two, that number second place, that's the Stone Blind, and that is the story of or reimagination of uh, Medusa. Uh, as I said, this one could be third place or the, the other one could be a second place. Uh, what sway, swayed me around is just because I love Greek mythology more than I love Italian history. So that's why this particular one occupies the second place. And plus, it is a reimagination of life of Medusa. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's got to be, gotta be fantastic. So what this book reminds me of, of Circe, uh, written a couple of years ago, uh, that's reimagination of Circe, the, the, the goddesses who like to turn sailors into pigs. Uh, this is a reimagination of Medusa. How, in fact, after reading this book, I have a much better understanding of, of the Gorgon sisters, and in particular Medusa, how she was actually the victim of the other goddesses. Um, namely um, Poseidon and Athena. She was the way with snake hairs and terrible looks turning people into stone with a single glance. That was the result of Athena's curse. And she was a complete victim. Has nothing to do whatsoever <laughs> against her. You really have to read this book. I mean, this is one that I highly, highly recommend. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and that's why it's at number second place. Okay, so at number one, and this is definitely my favorite book of the year so far, and that is the uh, biography of Elon Musk, written by Walter uh, Isaacton. Um, I did a full review. Uh, I'll put a link here. So if you haven't read it already, uh, you haven't seen it already, have a have a look here. Uh, and by the way, um, Stone Blind about Medusa I also did a full review. I put it back, you can see it. Um, so Elon Musk, before, before I read, uh, read this book, I knew almost nothing about Elon Musk. I know that he was the owner of Tesla, the owner of SpaceX, but that's pretty much it. Um, the biography is very detailed. So it chronographs his childhood and that brutal, brutal childhood in 70s um, or yeah, late 60s, early 70s, South Africa, um, apartheid sort of period. Very brutal, um, how he grew up. His father plays a major role, a major negative role in his life. And 
you know, he grew up in that sort of tumultuous sort of period, how he ended up in Canada first and then in the US and how he started starting to build his business empire from uh, the original sort of um, x.com, which is a directory service to PayPal, how he got kicked out of PayPal to start his own business uh, and the Tesla SpaceX or SpaceX first, I think, uh, and Tesla. And what really impressed me the most is that this guy, despite being the richest person in the world, he was not driven and he still isn't driven by profit, by money. Money really is a consequence of his success. His aim predominantly is to save humanity. I know it sounds grand, but that's what he believes and that he, what, that's what he's doing. Now think about it, guys. He single-handedly created a electric car segment prior to um, Tesla. There's no electric cars. So think about how much contribution he contributed towards climate change or towards the alleviation of climate change. The other thing, even grander ambition, is to make human race a multi-planetary uh, species. His aim is for us to actually occupy Mars or other planets within solar system in case that the Earth no longer able to support humanity in the future. And SpaceX sent out so many rockets, more rockets than the USA, than China, than Russia, than all those three incredible countries can put together. Come on. So it is absolutely incredible. And I really, it is a big, big, big book. It's 700 pages, nearly 700 pages. So it, it will take significant time for people to actually read it. But please, if I recommend any of these books here, I will strongly recommend this particular one. I loved it. I have a brand new understanding of Elon Musk, who he is, who he has been. You know, prior to reading this book, I have my own sort of literary heroes. I have my other political heroes. I have, you know, um, actors, actresses, politicians, podcasters, radio presenters, TV presenters that I categorize, categorize as my heroes or heroines. They pale. They become colorless, monochromatic, in front of Elon Musk, in under compared to Elon Musk's ambition, all their ambitions, all what they are doing, pales, you know, become colorless. And I haven't seen anyone like Elon Musk. I haven't read anyone like Elon Musk in, 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 in the world. And it's just fantastic. Please, please do read it. It is phenomenal. And Walter Isaacson, he is a great writer. He wrote a biography of Steve Jobs, Einstein, uh, and Leonardo da Vinci, so he's definitely assured as a writer, so please check him out. Um, absolutely amazing writer, absolutely amazing book. But guys, that's that's pretty much it for this episode. I just thought I'd share some of my thoughts of the books I read this month with you guys. Um, please leave a comment down below if you have read any of them, or if those books are actually on your TBRs. Let me know what your thoughts are. Um, I will, well, being the month of October, I'll bring uh, a couple episodes about horror books, recommendations. I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm doing that very, very soon. Uh, it's Halloween season, uh, so that is a must. And also, I'm looking to bring uh, more recommendations about um, autumn read, autumnal read in general, and they have to be cozy and cool. Uh, but anyway, that's the end of this episode. Uh, please share a like. Uh, it really does help a new channel like mine. And until next time, guys, cheerio.